As Priya mentioned, my name is Dave Robinson. I'm with Kaiser Permanente. Um, once we're ready here, I'll describe a little bit about the company. We're located largely in the uh, western, states, western states of the United States, but we do have a national presence. Um, we, uh, we have about almost 200,000 employees. Um, we're a fully integrated healthcare organization, so our doctors, our nurses, all of the clinicians, as well as our employees are all part of our plan. Um, having trouble advancing. Okay. There we go. You, you may have to help me. There we go. Um, our vision at Kaiser Permanente is to provide uh, total health, and so we really believe that um, the entire organization is not only about caring for our members, but also caring for our, our community. There we go. Today what I wanted to present to you is a case study on uh, how we are working with our buy to pay organization, very similar to what Ted described with Coca-Cola. Um, we are uh, responsible for about, um, I think it's about $18 billion in spend for our company in buying medical products and services for the entire organization. In the past, what we used, and, and we still largely use to this day, is a model uh, similar to what Jeff described at, uh, at Bose where we start with our leaders at the top talking about how to achieve breakthrough goals for the organization, and then moving from that into uh, what sort of capabilities we're going to need for the organization in order to move that forward. And then using sort of a local model, which I'll describe in a slide coming up, on how to improve the organization at a local level by bringing folks together first um, in building that strength capability that we talk about. So this was sort of the old way where we uh, used a Lean Six Sigma approach and were very successful. And I've got a slide where I can talk about some of the results related to that. But uh, similar to what Ted said, we learned that we needed to do things a little bit differently. Um, some of the capabilities that we talked about that are required in order for us to achieve the breakthrough. I'm not going to spend much time on this just so that we can keep moving. Here's this slide where we talk a little bit about, um, uh, a, it was a, a training institute that we built um, almost 10 years ago now, uh, where we brought all of our clinicians, some of the leaders within the organization together, and uh, we're training them on this sort of Lean Six Sigma approach. We call that wave one, and we're now on wave 11. And we've achieved some great results with that. You can see you know, between 2008 and 2015, we've trained over 2,000 people. We're continuing to train about 1,000 people a year. And um, we've had some really great success rates with these folks graduating. And what they have to do is, is once they go through the Improvement Institute, um, in order for them to get what we would call a green belt certification, they're responsible for um, leading to improvement um, uh, initiatives within their organization. And when they do that, then they get their green belt. After that, they have an opportunity to move through our advanced institute where they'll get their black belt certification. Um, great results. Um, what you can see is the ROI isn't nearly as high as it wants to be. What we found with this model was that um, even though we had some really great initial um, expectations for what we could achieve with the um, with these improvements, what we were finding was that um, more often than not, we just couldn't get that change to stick. And so we were trying to figure out what do we do differently. Um, learning organizations talks a little bit about that there. Uh, but what we really found out was that um, this whole idea of Lean Six Sigma really doesn't get into the customer's experience, just like Ted talked about. And so. What we're doing now is we're bringing that human-centric and systems-driven process improvement approach together, and we've created a new model that we're now using, which I'm going to describe a case study around that that we used uh, this year with some really, excuse me, really great results. 
I'm just going to click them all forward here. Um, similar to what Ted talked about with Coca-Cola, one of the things that we felt like we were really good at in the beginning was using sort of the Six Sigma approach, a systems level approach, to identify what the, the problems were with an organization. It could have been you know, something within uh, the medical center around a, a quality score or a, a, a particular rating that they wanted to improve. And so we'd have these you know, uh, Six Sigma improvement advisors uh, sit down with the team and try to figure out what they wanted to do differently. But what we weren't doing is we weren't even talking to any of our, our patients or our um, you know, the customers who were involved in that process. So in the second stage here of this new improvement model, which we put out, um, we're doing more work around journey mapping and what we call video ethnography. And I have a great uh, short clip that I'm gonna show you on how we do that um, within our organization now. And so we use not only this uh, sort of the Six Sigma uh, you know, uh, tools and methodology that we had in the past, but we're also now taking in all of this really kind of critical uh, customer information, and we're using both of those to create a framework and model for how we want to move forward with our improvement. Um, here's an example of just using journey mapping as a part of our process. And you'll see a little bit more on this in just a, in a minute. Setting ...and try and understand their experience, their culture, what really matters to them, and make sense of all of that. What we're doing at Kaiser Permanente is we're coupling that ethnographic work, that social science, with video as a way to really understand our member needs and use that insight and understanding to drive quality improvement. We go to the bedside and we ask them questions that no one normally asks them. What can we do differently? What can we do better? What matters to you? This is about us, the leadership of Kaiser Permanente, the Care Management Institute, really wanting to understand what your experience is, whether you're a patient, you're a physician, or you're a nurse, and how we can do the right thing. They've taken the time to step back and say, you know, let's listen to them. You know, how do I, um, uh, what is it that I'm doing is working? What is it that I'm doing is not working? All of that gets used to really develop new ways to do things and transform the way we think about our members and the way we design the care that we deliver. While we start with questions, we also let them drive the interview and take us where they want to go. Video ethnography doesn't stand on its own. It's a set of tools that can be incorporated into an overall performance improvement strategy. One of the main populations we've worked with is people who are leaving the hospital and headed home, and we need to make sure they can do that safely and with confidence that they'll be able to take care of themselves. The potential for video ethnography is that it has given us a new way to understand our members' needs, and, and even more importantly, to connect with our members in a much deeper way. What I wanted to describe here is um, how we use that video ethnography along with some different types of interviews in order to gain information regarding this uh, buy to pay process that I talked about before. So this case study starts with our chief of um, procurement and supply chain uh, challenging um, my team and our organization to build a customer experience uh, management strategy for our organization. How are we going to take our organization forward? Um, Ted and I were talking before, and even with Bernard, what we're finding is, is that we're all doing very similar type of work. In our particular case, and even when we were talking with Ted, it was like, you know, who is the customer? In our particular case, we identified three types of customers. We have uh, our internal buyers, so these are the folks, these are the clinicians inside the hospital who are looking for products and or services to provide care for our members. That's one group. We have the suppliers who we work very closely with in order to make sure that those products and services are provided to those buyers. And then ultimately we have the members within our uh, buy to pay organization who are responsible for executing on those. Uh, what you see here is sort of a list of the people that we talked to. This was over about a three-month period. We talked to, I think, almost 100 people trying to understand what their journey was 
in, in, as a part of this process. Um, and what we came up with was um, uh, a, an, an interesting framework that we wanted to share with them. So it was like taking all of this very detailed information that we got, we basically built a profile, I think about seven profiles altogether for the types of people who are responsible or involved in this process. And what we wanted to do is to present it in a concise way that they could take this information and use it going forward to help us build our solutions. So what we did was, um, the first thing that they told us was, you know, we need clarity in the systems. And so when they go into our, um, our enterprise resource system, we call it one link, and they're trying to buy products. One of the things they said is, is once I order it, I have absolutely no idea where it is in the process. You know, can you tell me, am I halfway through or am I, am I missing altogether? Or we had suppliers say, you know, I'm working with you on a contract. I don't know where I am in the contract lifecycle. Why is it taking so long? So they said again, clarity of systems. The other thing they said is, is that if I'm in your system, I shouldn't need a 21-page cheat sheet in order to execute a transaction. So they said, you know, what we're really looking for is something like an Amazon experience. And um, you know, it shouldn't be that difficult to find products in the system, and it shouldn't be that difficult to execute on that work. Um, finally, then, they said that when um, the system is easy and when it's clear, then I feel like my job is meaningful. You know, it shouldn't be painful to do my job. We, when we talked to uh, one lady who was trying to buy an inkblot printer for one of our groups, she said, it took me eight months to get this printer in. It was a, a non-standard item in the system, so I had to order it special. Once it got into our loading dock, the IT department said that they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't move it upstairs because we didn't have the right insurance for it. So she said an, an entire organization was completely held up by the fact that we were doing something a little bit different. And she said, you know, all I wanted to do was just to help a department do their job, and it was so difficult. And so clear, easy, and meaningful then is what we presented back to the organization and said, this is how we need to solve our, our, uh, you know, our business problem moving forward. And so this framework that you see here now has been used uh, to pull a team of executives together, and so they're now working on solutions for this customer experience management initiative and one of the things we said is no matter what you do, we're going to go back and test it against these, uh, this framework with, is it clear, is it easy, and is it gonna provide meaningful work for the group? Um, uh, I think one of the things that we found out too is, is that all of that really hard work that we put into place already doesn't go away. So you know, where you've done the value stream mapping and you understand where your leading and lag times are, where you're, you're getting stopped in that lean process where there's extra work or where you're holding and waiting, you can still use that, but what you need to do is you need to marry that journey on top of it. So, um, thank you. Um, so what we're moving forward with is this consolidated approach or this uh, combined approach of uh, those really strong lean Six Sigma principles that you have, you know, here you see the journey mapping, or sorry, the uh, value stream mapping, but then loading that journey stream map on top of it. Um, so what we've done in the past where we used to make these very big strategic decisions around how we wanted to move forward either from a business perspective or a technology perspective, we're now using our users or what we call customer-centered design in order to take us forward. Um, so basically, again, this is sort of the approach that we're taking going forward. One of the areas that I just wanted to leave you with is another nice video, but we've been really uh, focused recently on seeing what we can do to give back to the community in an area where we're really working is in depression care. So I wanted to leave you with one final video on where Kaiser's, just one area where Kaiser's moving forward um, in this, this area using human-centered design to help us advance our work. A poem that a, that a young man wrote uh, regarding his journey through uh, depression and making his way to, to feeling better and so um, he's he's sort of walking um, in a field and uh, and he's talking about sort of the, the the conflicting emotions that he has and we were uh, we were using this video uh, to to talk about the the issue of child suicide you know or the the, the growth in that area and so here's a, a young man he's probably 12 or 13 
making his way through that into um, you know, a more productive and feeling healthier about his life. And so he uses his, this poem that he sort of talks to as his way. And so I just wanted to finish with some of the really sort of great things we're doing right now in that, in that area. So I'll stop with that. And, uh, and I, I think we're out of question time, right? Oh, OK. So I think we're going to have a panel in just a few minutes, and we can take any additional questions then. Thank you very much.